the original writings of the Gadarites have been published, adds Ajmer Singh. Rebutting criticism by the left intellectuals, that he is bent upon presenting the Gadarites as faithful Sikhs, Ajmer Singh dishes out the facts that leaving a few Hindu and Muslim participants in the Gadar movement, as many as 96 to 98 percent were Sikhs from Punjab, particularly from Lahore, Amritsar, Gurdaspur, Ferozpur, and Ludhiana districts of the central Punjab dominated by the Sikh agriculturalists. Rejecting Puri's contention that the Gadari Babas had dissolved their Sikh identity into a pan Indian identity, Ajmer's book quotes historical facts extensively affirming the warm relations of the Gadari Babas with the Sikh Gadwara Parbandak Committee. SGPC, a statutory body that manages the Sikh religious affairs, and the Akali Dal. Installation of the Gadari Baba, Vaisakha Singh, as religious head of the Akal Takht, in the 1930s, was a proof of that. To support this, Ajmer also quotes eminent Marxist thinker, Professor Randir Singh, who wrote a pamphlet on the Gadar movement in 1945, underlining the popularity of the Gadari Babas among the Sikhs. The Sikh Panth has chosen Baba Vaisakha Singh, as Jadadar of the Akal Takht, who is the most respected personality and a household name among the Sikh farmer families. Heroic tales of Gadari Babas like that of Baba Gurmukh Singh Lalto, are on the lips of Sikh children in Punjab. Heroic deeds of immortal Karta Singh Sarabha, and his companions are sung by the Sikh farmer families. Professor Singh, thus, presents an indisputable testimony to the fact that the majority of Gadarites were hailing from Sikh farming families, and they had settled in their native villages following their escape from the gallows, and release from prisons. Later, the proposing of Sohan Singh Bukna, as an unanimous choice for the office of the SGPC president, by the SGPC members in 1936, goes to testify that the Gadarites remain staunch Sikhs and closer to the Sikh leadership. Anyhow, the proposal fell through at the 11th hour because of some extraneous factors. In the Andaman Cellular Jail, they went on hunger strikes and work strikes for the rights of Sikh prisoners. Several of their comrades lost their lives from severe beatings and punishments. The very first day in the Andaman Jail, they refused to be harnessed to the oil mill, the most brutal type of hard labor, that is, extracting 30 pounds of oil daily in expellers. Only young Sikhs who were of strong build, weighing between 200 to 250 pounds, were capable of doing hard labor, but they refused on the ground that it was inhumane. The oil mill was fixed in every cell. Baba Gurmukh Singh writes, no food was given to prisoners until the daily amount was extracted. Baba Sohan Singh Buckner writes, if the amount extracted was even a pound less, the prisoner was given 30 lashes. To avoid punishment, some committed suicide. There were one or two suicide cases every month. In some cases the flogging was so severe, that the prisoner died in hospital the next day, writes Ragbir Singh. The prisoners struck work on 13 January 1916. Baba Sohan Singh Bukna, Nidan Singh Chugga, Pr Singh Lungiri, Gurmukh Singh Lalton, and all of the Gadari prisoners refused to work on the oil mill. They were determined to fight back. The chief commissioner who came, went about threatening to flog everyone. On each prisoner's ticket was entered, six month solitary confinement, danda berry, penal diet, and standing handcuffs for a week. The battle began. Other batches of the prisoners of the Gadar conspiracy now reached the Andamans, and joined in their struggle. But Jailer Berry and Superintendent Murray, claimed to have beaten tougher men into submission, and the struggle continued. Prisoners began to be deliberately starved, the sick remained uncared for, and the thirsty were refused water. Every week there were two to four prisoners bleeding from their anus, writes Uttam Singh Kassail. Even the peaceful and saintly Vaisakha Singh sang out against the three tyrants of the Andamans. Baba Vaisakha Singh wrote a short poem describing the scenes. The colors of the creator are beautiful Gurmukhs. The Andamans made us realize this. Enduring hardships daily O Vaisakha. We were taught how to accept God's will. Lotties showered down on bodies. Skin was torn off like peeled fruit. 
beautiful bodies were trampled underfoot. Rivers of blood began to ooze. Words slip from the mouth easily Khalsa. But to pass the time is to know the truth. Not a moan was uttered from our mouths. The tyrants knew that they would lose. We were locked up in our cells. Our minds were absorbed in the mystic name. Detached from the earthly world. We were in communion with the timeless Lord. Bearing the cruelties of tyrants on our heads. We found pleasure even in suffering. A strong bond of love existed between us. We would share each other's pain. Seeking the welfare of all persons. We fought the tyrant's tooth and nail. Hoping to improve the lot of humanity. Our hearts prayed for the good of all. Gurbani is the image of the Guru, brother. It teaches us to search our souls. A great soul has put me on the path. To unlock the tenth gate of consciousness. We were tortured in a number of ways. But our time passed in perfect peace. Hear the story of the Andamans, sings. We were all seated in meditative poise. In the Andamans the terror increased. Refusal to work on Sundays, a holiday, was disobedience. To complain of injustice was to make baseless allegations against responsible jail officials with malicious intent. In July 1916, eight Gadarites were given six months of solitary confinement for disobeying the order. They were Master Chatter Singh Sangla, Bhijawala Singh, Master Udham Singh, Bhai Hazara Singh, Bhai Sohan Singh, Bhai Kher Singh, Bhai Kushal Singh, and Bhai Jagat Ram. Jagat Ram didn't participate in any jail struggles thereafter, writes Udham Singh Kassail. Some of them had just returned from six months of solitary confinement before being banged up again. For the humiliating treatment meted out to the prisoners, Master Chatter Singh Sangla slapped Superintendent Major Murray on the face. Murray fell off his chair. For this bold act, Chatter Singh was beaten unconscious by the prison guards and thrown into a small cage, where he would remain for the next four years. Baba Vaisakha Singh writes, by Amar Singh and Vishen Singh, raised their voices against the injustice meted out to Chatter Singh. They wanted to suffer with their comrade. The cruel superintendent locked them up as well. Both of these lions sat down and meditated on the Nam. They both contemplated, you are one, but you manifest yourself in a variety of ways. This is the will of the creator. The washing of hair with an indigenous stuff in the absence of soap and tap water, was a breach of prison discipline. Punishment followed in each case, handcuffs and fetters, gunny clothes, solitary confinements, and bread and water became a part of their daily routine. The prisoners knew, that sturdy physiques had first been broken inside the prison, before they were flogged for non-fulfillment of their quota of hard labor. And they fought on all the more determined and all the more desperately. They had to drink salt water, or sea water to quench their thirst. The small latrine was kept shut most of the day and night. It only opened in the morning. The daily ration was, 10 ounces of bread, 14 ounces of rice, and 4 ounces of lentil soup. The food that was given was not fit for human consumption, and Baba Sohan Singh Bukna had to observe fast in protest against this many times. The guards would indulge in the usual treatment, force feeding through the nostril, physical torture, and flogging. Baikar Singh Marhana, and Bai Amar Singh, had to wage a prolonged struggle to win the right of getting drinking water for Sikh prisoners, who washed their hair every morning in accordance with the Sikh religion. They had to spend years tied to chains for this right alone. The Sikhs also agitated for the right to wear turbans instead of caps, writes Ragbir Singh. Sant Vaisakha Singh was the leader of this group. Prisoners were punished for greeting each other with, Wahi Guruji Ka Khalsa, Wahi Guruji Ki Fati, or Sat Sri Akal. They were not allowed to communicate with each other during work time. Baba Nidan Singh was given six month solitary confinement for the crime of reading a book. When the jailer mockingly asked him, Well, how do you feel now? Baba Nidan Singh replied, Handcuffed and fettered, locked up in a cell day and night, with little to eat, how do you think I feel? You should be ashamed of yourself. Get out of my sight. 
Then in November 1917, Bai Bon Singh was arrayed before the jailer, for making an insulting remark to a British guard. Bon Singh complained that the guard swore at him in English first. The jailer, ignoring the plea of Bon Singh, slammed six months of solitary confinement, fetters, reduced diet, and standing handcuffed for the said period. One day while standing under the constraint of handcuffs, he was chanting the Shabbat, if you wish to play the game of love, come to me with your head in your palm, in a state of ecstasy. Mr. Berry, the ill-famed jailer, happened to pass nearby who started abusing him. Bon Singh, in protest, refused to submit himself to standing handcuffed on the following day. Jailer arrived with a posse of three jail officials, and started belaboring Bon Singh. Down below on the ground floor his fellow prisoners, Master Udham Singh, Bai Gurmukh Singh, Baba Vaisakha Singh, and Parmanand Jansi, were sitting in the enclosure for food. When they learned of this, they all rushed above to rescue him. But the jailer had already closed the gate of the line. They could not therefore enter, but made the jailer leave him alone. Master Udham Singh and Parmanand Jansi went back to their cell, but Gurmukh Singh confronted the jailer. The jailer and his men beat him with their sticks, but Gurmukh Singh fought back. Though saved for the moment, the jailer got Bon Singh thrashed the next day so much, that he fell unconscious. Before passing out, Bon Singh said to the guards, Hey tyrants! Don't leave me alive this time. Let me have the honor of laying down my life for my nation. Baba Vaisakha Singh wrote a poem describing this incident. The jailer took with him ten wards. And went to confront my brother. Standing face to face with him. They beat him hither and thither. Seeing my brother's condition. I let out a loud cry of defiance. Stand where you are, O oh tyrants. Stop beating him like cowards. The jailer's anger knew no bounds. He ordered us six to be punished. I will drink your blood he yelled shouting profanities at us. Harsh treatment was then awarded. How cruelly we were all whipped. Seeking the sanctuary of the Creator. The name Wahiguru fell from our lips. On learning what had happened, fellow prisoners resorted to work strike. The prison commissioner, sent a misrepresented report to the Daily Bengali newspaper about the strike. The report stated, Bon Singh was handcuffed because he refused to stand up in a parade. He claims to have been flogged, but after careful inquiry, it was found that this is not true. Twenty-nine prisoners have gone on strike in protest. Bon Singh was shifted to jail hospital where his condition went from worse to worst. Ultimately, 60-year-old Bon Singh succumbed to the brutal ordeal. Seeing this, his fellow prisoners started a hunger strike besides work strike. In the meantime, revolutionaries who had been convicted in the Burma conspiracy case also came, and they too joined the work strike. It was winter. The jailers started torturing the starving prisoners, by forcibly getting them removed to the water tank, and got cold water thrown on them. Blankets were removed from their cells, and they would thereby lie on bare cold wooden planks. When they had become so weak that they could barely walk, they were made to stand up and dragged by their chains. Pandit Ram Rakha, of Hashi Arpur, died in the process. Bai Rulia Singh Sarabha, and Bai Nan Singh also became martyrs. Baba Sohan Singh Bukna fell seriously ill, but was not permitted to visit the hospital because he was fasting. The prison doctor thought of sending medicines to him secretly. Babaji sent the message, I appreciate your concern. But it is against Sikh principles for me to accept medicine like this. Prithvi Singh, continued his hunger strike even after the fast had ended. He had to be force-fed many times. His associates pleaded with him to end the strike, but he wouldn't listen. Baba Sher Singh couldn't hold himself back. To persuade Prithvi Singh, he swallowed small pieces of broken glass, and consequently suffered incessant vomiting. Blood began to pass out with his feces. He was taken to the prison hospital, where he was given medicine and sent back to his cell. All this just to have a meeting with Prithvi Singh. 
when Prithvi Singh received the news of his sacrifice, tears flowed from his eyes. He was overwhelmed by this selfless act. More martyrs began to die at their posts. Buddha Singh, Ralia Singh, Nan Singh, Kher Singh, Natha Singh, Rhoda Singh, all fell one after another, but abandoned and forgotten by their people, these heroes fought on, their backs to the wall. Bhai Parmanand Lahore, another life-term convict, steered away from the prison struggle. He did however use his medical background to help patients at the prison hospital. His duty was to check temperatures of the sick, and to distribute milk among them. If the political prisoners wanted to see each other, they would go to the hospital. Treatment was rarely available for prisoners who suffered from diseases such as malaria or TB. The prison hospital was the size of a small room and resources were scarce. 70% of TB patients who were admitted to the hospital, were likely to die. Binan Singh met his death this way. Thrice did Sohan Singh Buckner resort to hunger strike. Baba Jawala Singh lived imprisoned in cages for years, Ruhr Singh stood chained to the walls for weeks on end, and young Gurmukh Singh defied all these grueling tortures. Bhai Kala Singh and Bhai Ruhr Singh refused to stand up in a parade. For this they were handcuffed and fettered for six months. It became almost routine. Master Chatter Singh had spent three years inside a small cage in a pathetic condition. His condition became so critical, that he could only digest rice starch. His body had been reduced to bones. But this gaunt man never complained about his condition to anyone. On May 30, 1919, Baba Sohan Singh Bhakna decided to take up his case. He was joined by Bhai Amar Singh and Bhai Bishan Singh. They went on strike once again. Jailer Barry began to tremble when a prisoner kicked him. Murray was also knocked down. After months of agitation, Murray removed Chatter Singh's fetters, but didn't release him from the cage. To everyone's relief, Jailer Barry who had been humbled by the prisoners was replaced by Mr. Miller. Barry fell ill and died from natural causes soon after he left the island. Months rolled by before Superintendent Major Murray was finally replaced by Major Barker. But Barker was no different from his predecessor. Baba Sahan Singh Bakna's threats of going on hunger strike had virtually no effect on the new superintendent. When the hunger strike was in its second month in August 1920, Barker used all his force to break it, but failed. Bhai Kesar Singh, Baba Jawala Singh and other political prisoners threatened to join Baba Sohan Singh in his fast, if Master Chatter Singh was not freed. On seeing the unity of the political prisoners, Major Barker relented and freed Chatter Singh from the cage, on November 28, 1920. When the good news was conveyed to Bhai Amar Singh, he was in deep meditation, and didn't like to be disturbed. Whenever he was absorbed in Waheguru's name, he refused to leave his meditations to stand up in parades or listen to anyone. He would say, I am no one's slave. I will not do hard labor or stand in parades. There were moments of humor too. Baba Jawala Singh was known as the drum, and by Sher Singh the elephant. He was given this name because he drank a bucket full of milk in one go. Sometimes they would race against each other in their shackles. Sometimes roll their clothes into a ball and play football. In 1919, Karta Singh Jabber, was arrested for anti-government protests following the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, and awarded a sentence in the Andaman jail. Here he met the Gadar revolutionaries, and Kamagata Maru prisoners. On the night of June 27th to 28th, Karta Singh Jabber woke up at 2 a.m., and heard some convicts in the front barracks reciting Sukhumani Sahib. From another cell he heard Sri Japji Sahib being recited. He imagined this place to be a village of Gursikhs rather than a jail. He peeped through a ventilator towards another side, and heard Asar Divar being read. Jabber realized that actually he was in Sachkhand, or Realm of Truth. But when he looked towards the door, he noticed the usual iron gate and the same dark dungeon. In the adjoining cell was a Muslim convict, Jala by name, from Jalam district. Jabber inquired of him about those reciting prayers. Jala replied, they are by Sahibjis. 
which by Sayabjis, Jabber asked. Baj Baj Wala by Sayabjis, he replied, referring to the Baj Baj harbor, where the Kamagata Maru passengers were stopped by the British authorities. Hearing this reply, Jabber greatly regretted the historic blunder of the caretaker of Darbar Sahib, Arur Singh, who had issued a distorted edict from Sri Akaltak Sahib, that they were not devout Sikhs, who had bravely faced the British and police brutalities at Baj Baj Harbour. After five months, Jabber was transferred to No. 4 Barak. There he met by heart at Singh, and other Gur Sikhs from the Malwa region. After two months, he was sent to Barak No. 3. There he met Baba Nidan Singh of Chugga. He was very old, yet he would wash with a mug of water at 9 p.m., and begin reciting Gurbarni till 8 a.m., the following morning. He would not speak to anyone until he had performed his prayers. Extract from the Jeevani of Sardar Karta Singh Jabber In Urawada jail, they had to go on a prolonged hunger strike to win turbans for Sikh prisoners. There as per jail rules, they were made to sport caps instead of turbans and Sikh breeches. When Baba Sohan Singh Bukna, Baba Kesar Singh Thatgar, and other Sikh prisoners resisted, they were forcibly disrobed. The prisoners went on hunger strike. For six months their hands were cuffed behind their backs. Their condition went from bad to worse, but not one of the Sikh prisoners wore a cap. On September 8, 1925, Baba Vaisakha Singh met them at Urawada jail, and gave them news about the ongoing Akali agitation. The prisoners were stirred by the sacrifices of the Akalis. Baba Sohan Singh Bukna's words were, How unfortunate that we could be of no service to the Panth, or the country in this hour of need. Quoted from, Day Say Work, October 15, 1925. The saintly Vaisakha Singh, had written many religious poems while he was incarcerated. Here are some excerpts. Some persons say that there is no God. They proclaim and spread this falsehood. I hereby state the truth, true God has shown his presence to the Bhagats. Many Mahatmas have stressed that one should give up the householder's life, and have resort to the seclusion of the forest. There, they suggest, one should take to ascetic practices, give up food and clothing, and starve the beautiful human body to a skeleton. For the purpose, they recommend all kinds of self-inflicted tortures, including hanging oneself upside down, standing erect all the time and smearing the head and the body with ashes. Some get themselves beheaded at Kashi, others have their limbs mutilated. Do not imagine that it is easy to have one's head removed in the name of God. But, hail Guru Nanak and the Ten Gurus, who have shown a lovely, glorious, and straight path, without fruitless self-tormenting of the body. No practice of self-mortification can destroy the snake of egoism. Live as a householder in the world, and follow the advice of the gurus for earning your living by honest means, and for sharing your income with others. Live well and keep your body, house, and clothes neat and clean, remembering God all the time. Give good education both to your boys and girls. Be on your guard against the wiles of the ego self, and follow the way of Nam. The ego misleads you. Beware of it, and keep yourself onto the path of God, always remembering Him. Control your ego, otherwise it is likely to lead you into difficulties, and land you in deep waters. Be strong and hold enough to keep it under check, because few can escape its machinations. Practice your meditation and concentration, in order to keep the mind in tune with the word of God, thereby hearing the unstruck music. If you keep your mind attuned to Waheguru, you will remain tranquil and in peace, and have no pain and suffering. Always raise your voice against those who are tyrannical to man. Bring those who shun the poor and the weak onto the right path. There is but one God and we are all his children. Let us love one and all. Fill your heart with the love of God, second serve your country, and third, use your earnings for the service of man. Practice these three virtues and educate your children to do the same. God approves and acclaims those who imbibe these values. At another time he said, the mystic bliss is so intense, that a moment's disconnection with it, 
would be like death to me, but the higher stage than that is not to remain enthralled in it, but, side by side, to work consistently for the well-being of suffering humanity. He would say, you know what is the will of God for me. You also know that in doing political work, I am only carrying out his will, and not my own will, in wanting me to remain engrossed in mystic bliss and in doing missionary work. He also wrote the following poems on Sikh history. They carried away the wife of one Brahmin in Kasur. But you saved the honor of her weeping husband. You surrounded an army of Patan soldiers. And conquered all of their twelve forts. It was you, who rescued the wife of the Brahmin. And reunited her with her spouse. It was you, who taught the sinners a lesson. And killed the tyrant for his evil acts. After the lions punished Wazir Khan. You raised the foundations of Sir Hind to the ground. You charged into Sadasar like a wind. And brought Masar Rangur's severed head. It was you who brought victory in Kabul and Delhi. The extirpator of tyrants from this country. You installed the banner of freedom in America. You woke up India from its sleep. Only you can liberate our Gadwaras now. And put an end to the reign of false priests. BT has inflicted cruelties on the lions at Guru Kabag. But in you they have found joy and peace. Your acts of generosity are beyond count. Who can know your hidden secrets? May they perish who seek your demise. Only you shall remain forever truthful. In another poem he writes. You may already know of the tyranny brothers. Gadwara Rekab Ganj of Delhi was demolished. In Kanpur a mosque was razed by force. The Amritsar Sarovar was closed by sinners. Khalsa College is being controlled by them. Wrong education is imparted to our children. God has been very gracious to us. The Satguru has awakened us from indolence. Sweet is your will said the fifth Satguru. Seated comfortably on a burning hot pan. The ninth Guru gave his head in Delhi. For righteousness he obeyed the Lord's command. The aged Mati Das came to my mind. Whose head was sawn in twain. Mani Singh was cut limb from limb. Bhai Taru Singh spoke of no pain. Bhai Subeg Singh and his son became martyrs. Maytab brought the head of Masar Rangar. Baba Deep Singh then flashed before me. Swinging his sword like a Spartan. We are the sons and grandchildren of these men. Why should we waste our lives in vain? Stand up lions and regain your conscience. Don't waste your time in idleness again. When the war broke out in Europe, the Kamagata ship was forced to sail home. So we got together and passed a Gurmata. The time has now come for all of us to go. Hans Sarver, gives an account of the lives and views of a noted chain of Sikh mystics, who lived between 1830 and 1950. In that book, Baba Vaisakha Singh finds a prominent mention as one of the great personalities. The editor describes him as an outstanding living mystic. Most of his early morning was spent in his devotional remembrance of God and in meditation. Those in trouble made all kinds of requests to him for alleviating their sufferings. Invariably he prayed for them. Many cases have been verified in which he had done the healing. He never tried to take credit for the healing that took place. When anyone made a request, he would say, let us pray together to God to help us. And he would pray to God thereafter. Bhairandir Singh Narangwal, and his companions were arrested on May 9, 1915, and tried in what is commonly known as the Second Lahore Conspiracy Case. However, his love for the country's freedom, arose solely from the ideals of the Sikh Dharma, and whatever he did for the country, he did primarily as a true Gur Sikh, and not merely as a political freedom fighter. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in 1916, and his property confiscated. He was only 38 years old with a wife and three young children. The eldest 10-year-old daughter could not bear the separation from her dear father, and died within a month of his imprisonment. His son Balbir Singh was only six years old, and his daughter, Dalair Kaur was just two. His father Sardar Natha Singh also languished to death, but before dying he wrote to the governor of Punjab, 
that his son Randir Singh had no property of his own, and that his property which was meant for supporting his wife, his daughter-in-law and grandchildren, may please not be confiscated after his death. But contrary to the governor's assurance, the property was confiscated under pressure from Gajan Singh, advocate of Narangwal, and member of legislative council. When Gajan Singh brought the police to get the house confiscated, after the land had been confiscated, Kartakor, wife of Birandir Singh, refused to leave the house. Either you shoot me, or take me and my children to the prison. The villagers then put Gajan Singh to shame, and asked him to withdraw the police. Gajan Singh died on June 10, 1929, and soon after him his only son died, on February 12, 1936. During his prison term of over 15 years, Bhairandir Singh faced unprecedented sufferings. This was not for any political or personal reasons, but only for his determination to live strictly in accordance with the Khalsa Code of Conduct, made known to him at the time of initiation into the Khalsa Fold. In Multan Jail, one of the hottest places in Punjab, with temperatures going up to 122 degrees Fahrenheit in May and June, he remained without food and water continuously for 40 days. This was because he was not allowed to prepare his food himself, according to the Gurmat principles, and he would not take food prepared by non-Amrit Haris. The cruelty inflicted on him and his companions, is narrated in his autobiographical letters. When the new superintendent came, he easily became a victim of the evil influence of jailer Satin and my only sympathizer, the generous and kind medical officer, Dr. Narian Das, was also transferred earlier. Jailer Satinand once more started putting me to hard labor and torture. Physically I was so weak, that I could not perform any hard labor, but it was forced on me. It became impossible for me to work beyond my physical strength. As a result of this, I had to undergo one punishment after another. At times a number of punishments were given simultaneously. In the burning heat of Multan, where temperatures went up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, I was tied to the trees with crossbar on my feet, and hands fettered above. Over and above it, a canvas straitjacket was also put on. Our iron chains and handcuffs became so hot, that my arms began to bleed. Blood started dripping from the body and even from the nose. We were left all alone in this condition in the open sun. Not a drop of water was given either to drink or to clean the bleeding nose. As the Sikhs stood, tied to different trees, they sang loudly the hymns of the Guru Granth Sahib, and in peace and silence suffered the tortures, accepting it as the will of God. Our only sustenance was the spiritual hymns of the Guru Granth Sahib, which gave us unbounded moral and spiritual courage, to endure those terrible tortures. These tortures were given continuously for days and months. When nights were cold, we were made to stand with hands up all nights in the open, throughout the bitter cold season. At last the superintendent gave us a new punishment. He ordered that we should be flogged, but the new medical officer wrote on my history ticket, health very weak, unfit for flogging. But my companions by Harnam Singh of Gujarwal, was given 15 whips, and by Hari Singh of Amritsar district was given 30 whips. The authorities were annoyed when the medical officer refused to allow me to be flogged. They however got him transferred. Then a new medical officer, a Muslim came there. Both the superintendent and jailer Satin and approached him to sanction flogging for me. They asked him to allow at least five whippings with a cane. All the prisoners in Multan prison were seriously upset when they came to know about it. The new medical officer asked me to meet him in the hospital. When I went there, he said to me, the superintendent has asked me to recommend flogging on your body. I said. It is good news. They have been waiting for a long time for some medical officer to recommend flogging. They are determined to satisfy this ruthless craving. They are your superior officers. If you do not obey them, they will put you into trouble. As for me, you need not worry, I will accept it as the will of God. It appears my body was made to endure such torture. The medical officer said. I will certainly never do that. 
I am not going to favor anybody. I will only do justice. He then started examining my body very closely. After thorough examination for half an hour, he wrote on my history ticket, heart very weak, unfit for flogging, fit for light work only. At that time my heart was beating loudly with the rhythm of divine name and its music. The medical officer thought that my heartbeat was abnormal. When the medical officer wrote these words on the history ticket, the superintendent and jailer sat in and felt terribly crushed. Out of anger, they made me stand in the open sun all day, and sometimes all night for another week. The body was now so weak and frail, that I was reduced to a skeleton. By the grace of Guru and by the constant meditation and singing of Gurbani, my spiritual strength and powers were at their highest pitch. Then came winter. Just as it is extremely hot in the hot season, Multan is extremely cold in the cold season. Day and night, biting cold wind was continuously blowing. Now they took away our canvas straight jackets and also our blankets. During the three extremely cold months of November, December, and January, we were made to stand all night with chains on our hands and feet, and with no clothes except a small underwear, and a little head cover. Sometimes we were made to sit all night on the cold floor. The inner warmth of divine songs and the divine name, was the only thing in which we merged our mind and soul, and spent the most bitterly cold months of the year. Our bodies became numb and lost all physical consciousness, but by the grace of God, we continuously recited and contemplated the Sukhmani, and the meditation of the Divine Name continued with unbroken concentration. Thus in that terrible agony, we did not feel the pain. In sorrow we knew no sorrow. Otherwise the freezing cold might have ended our lives in a few days. This is the brief account of our life in Multan Jail, but the real story can be fully studied if my history sheet is copied word for word. I have briefly narrated the few things I remember. From Multan we went to Hazari Bagh. End of excerpt. Most of the convicts were transferred to Hazari Bagh prison, where they were made victims of police torture and maltreatment. In 1918, several Sikh prisoners belonging to the Gadar party, escaped from Hazari Bagh prison by scaling its wall. But they were soon apprehended by the police and given severe punishment. Bhirandir Singh who was lodged in Hazari Bagh jail, gives a graphical description of the clash that took place between the police officers and the Sikhs in his autobiographical letters. Quote. Excited with their courage and heroism, the prisoners jumped down from the top of the wall in hot haste, and all the five or six who did so, received very severe injuries on their feet. Some of them received such severe injuries that it was impossible for them to run. Others came down the wall a little cautiously. Bai Inder Singh was the first to land safely on the ground. He had just landed, when four armed guards surrounded him and caught him. The wounded Sikhs could not bear the sight of arrest and beating of Inder Singh. One of them, Bai Lal Singh of Narangwal, finding his comrade in trouble, stood up on his wounded and bleeding feet, and snatching a baton from a police guard, hit everyone right and left. Although Sundar Singh's feet were wounded, he came out like lightning, and resting a baton with a spear end from one of the policemen, he hit them right and left, and brought to the ground six of them. Others ran for their life. They then begged Sundar Singh to surrender peacefully on the condition that he and his companions, would not be beaten or maltreated. As soon as he surrendered, he was beaten to pulp. Yet Sundar Singh did not take the beating without retaliating with his hands and wounded feet. Everyone was stunned by his courage and unconquerable spirit. Then they searched the field and found the other runaway prisoners who were hiding close by. The cowards pounced on these helpless wounded lions, and tortured them with vengeance. Although all the five freedom fighters were half dead and made unconscious by beating, not one of them begged for mercy, and not one of them uttered a cry of pain. No one dared to come near them as long as Sundar Singh had the baton in his hands. There is some special quality in this land of five rivers, which makes the sons of this soil so fearless, that they mock at death in the face of greatest suffering and pain. They would never behave like cowards. When they were beaten so much that they became half dead, they were taken to the prison and locked in dark cells. 
Four days together, they were neither given a drop of water, nor any medicine, nor were their wounds bandaged. Even unwanted dogs are never treated that way. It was the cold season, and those merciless tyrants neither gave them a cot, nor even a blanket to cover their body. When we came to know of this inhuman cruelty, our blood began to boil in anger and resentment, but we were utterly helpless. We had nothing to offer them except silent prayer, and the hope that God would help them to face the terrible ordeal they were facing. Everyone had turned against them, the doctors and compounders were strictly ordered not to go near them. Everyone was after their life. They struggled for survival with great willpower. Without a morsel of food, and without a drop of water, they were left to starve and die of thirst. As a result of the ill treatment accorded to the runaway prisoners, Vadhavaram and the superintendent, were both degraded and shunted out of the place. Although the runaway prisoners were further punished by two years' increase in their prison's term, they taught these two cruel officers a good lesson. Three of them have not been arrested so far. They are, Sucha Singh, Tija Singh, and Buddha Singh. Seven others had already been brought to the prison, wounded, and badly injured. Eight others surrendered after a month and a half, after showing the courage of daredevils. The adventures of these runaway prisoners form a thrilling tale. Bareheaded and without even a shirt, the only thing they had were two staffs picked up from the cremation ground. They crossed the Sun River, even though half of them did not know how to swim. Even the Inquiry Commission was surprised at this feat. When once surrounded by hundreds of villagers, they broke their way through them with only two large sticks, and made good their escape into the forests. When they were extremely thirsty, they prayed for water. Immediately after the prayer, they heard frogs croaking at a distance and found some water at the place. When others slept, one of them kept guard at night. A wild bear once came near them, and finding one Sikh, he came with a companion bear to fight him. When the bear returned, two Sikhs were awake. The bear went away, and now four of them came. Finding four Sikhs awake, then eight of them came. Finding eight Sikhs were ready to fight them, they went away and never came back. Four days they wandered in the forest without a morsel of food. Two of them reached Banaras. They split themselves into three small groups which added to their difficulties. Had they moved together, no one would have dared to face them. The police announced by the beat of the drum that they were decoits, and thousands of people were sent after them to capture them. Armed with lotties, daggers, swords, spears, thousands of people surrounded these three unarmed, naked, starving Sikhs, Ganda Singh Nihang of Kapad Kari, Inder Singh of Sheikh Dolat, and Arjun Singh of Jagron. And yet they did not surrender without giving a tough fight to the police and the crowd. The other group of three, namely Baidal Singh of Dudike, Bai Gujar Singh Bukna, and Bai Sajan Singh Narangwal, were similarly surrounded by a large armed police force and an angry crowd, who was told that they were decoits. They snatched the arms and the lotties from the policemen, and fought for hours, beating everyone who came near them to pulp. The whole of Bihar and UP resounded with the stories of courage of these six Sikhs. At last an armed crowd of thousands closed upon them, and overpowered these brave patriots, who had not taken a morsel of food for weeks. They fought with fiery determination. After receiving many sword cuts, wounds from indiscriminate lottie charges, bleeding from head to foot, they fell unconscious on the ground. The valor and courage by Gujar Singh showed at this moment, cannot be expressed in words. Daggers and swords had caused deep injuries on the whole of his body, and yet he fought till he became unconscious. By Sajan Singh Narangwal writes, Hail Guru Gobind Singh, and hail to the Guru Panth, the Singhs refused to be arrested without putting up a fight. In the conflict, Gujar Singh Bukna's jaw was ripped apart, and his knee was broken in two pieces. By Inder Singh's knee was dislocated. We received many wounds. My arm had a deep cut. They were lifted on cots while I was dragged by ropes to Sasram Hospital. Even while these Sikhs were lying unconscious and half-dead on the ground, no one came near them for fear that they might get up suddenly, 
and kill the first man they got hold of. They were brought in this precarious condition to the prison, and to everyone's surprise their wounds healed soon enough. Binatha Singh Dun, and Harry Singh of Kakad, were arrested at Banaras and brought to the prison. A judicial inquiry was held, and all the runaway prisoners were convicted of breaking the jail. Although all the runaway prisoners were punished by the extension of their term of imprisonment by two years, Vadhavaram's treatment of the prisoners was condemned by the judges, and he was downgraded and severely censured. The inspector general, Bawajiwan Singh was also censured. The government took a serious note of his inability to handle the prisoners properly, by which he felt extremely humiliated. He avenged this humiliation by not giving either freedom or reduction of prison terms, which was sanctioned by the government for all political prisoners. One day by Sajan Singh, who was lodged in the adjacent cell, started reciting prayer, after taking his morning bath. Sadhu Radha Singh who was on duty as sentry, came and informed me that by Sajan Singh's finger had been cut, and while he was reciting the prayer, the finger was bleeding. Sadhu Radha Singh was wonderstruck at what he saw. Bai Sajan Singh was quite unconscious of his bleeding finger, and his mind was concentrated in the blissful thoughts of the prayer. Wonderful is the spiritual poise and achievement of the Sikhs, cried Sadhu Radha Singh. I interrupted Bai Sajan Singh's recitation at a point where he had just completed one hymn, and asked him, Well brother, what is the matter? How did it happen? Oh it is nothing he replied and continued the recitation. Sadhu Radha Singh brought to me the fingertip that had been cut away from his hand, to show me how serious the matter was. I asked him to attach the finger piece to his hand. When he tried to do so, Sajan Singh refused saying, such is the will of God. You need not worry about it anymore. It has remained cut off for a long time. Thus he disobeyed what I asked him to do. Over and above this, he applied oil to the cut end of the finger instead of keeping it clean with water till some medicine was applied. First his hand, and then his arm became septic. The swelling spread all over his arm, and the whole arm became an inflated balloon. The matter was at once reported to the hospital. A new superintendent had just joined the office. He was an expert surgeon from the Indian Medical Service. His name was Dr. Frederick. He also performed the duties of a medical officer. He was known to be a very efficient physician and surgeon. As soon as he examined by Sajan Singh, he ordered that he should be taken to the hospital. I particularly requested him to make a special effort to treat by Sajan Singh. Some of us even agreed to accompany Sajan Singh to nurse him, but Dr. Frederick assured us that he would take good care of by Sajan Singh. He did not even wait to inquire how the finger was cut, because he thought that the inquiry might obstruct or delay immediate treatment that was necessary. In the evening, the assistant surgeon came and informed me, that the condition of Bai Sajan Singh's arm had worsened. There was a danger of the infection spreading to the rest of his body. Another surgeon had been invited from the civil hospital for consultation. The whole medical board of expert surgeons had decided that the arm should be amputated. As there was no other way out, the amputation of the arm was likely to take place the next morning. I sent this sad news to all the comrades. It was decided that early the next morning, everyone would recite Japji five times, and pray for Bai Sajan Singh which everyone did. After I completed the recitation of Japji five times next morning, I felt an inner urge to say the congregational prayer, the Ardasa. It was a silent Ardasa which was performed without informing anyone. I prayed in the Ardasa that Bai Sajan Singh's arm may not be amputated, and if he was cured, he would offer Kara Prasad at the Golden Temple, as soon as he was released. This was the first time in my life that I performed such an Ardasa. I did it unconsciously. I did not have it in mind even a few minutes earlier. And this is what happened on the other side in the hospital. The physicians, the saints of God, have gathered together. The treatment is hopeful and effective. Because God himself is a witness to the healing. Lo, the patient is rid of all sins, maladies, and sorrows. Guru Arjan, Funye.
The doctors were now around Sajan Singh who lay absorbed in silent prayer, ready for amputating his arm. Dr. Frederick examined the arm, and thinking that Bai Sajan Singh was asleep, he woke him up saying, Wake up, we have to administer chloroform to you. Why? asked Sajan Singh. Because your arm has to be amputated, replied the surgeon. It is not necessary to keep me under chloroform. You can amputate the arm without it. You will find that I will not move nor complain, in the least, of pain. Go ahead, said Sajan Singh. The surgeon was taken aback at the courage and endurance powers of this twenty-year-old young man. He wondered what these Sikhs were made of. Even at such a young age they could look at suffering and pain with such stoic indifference. For a moment he hesitated to amputate the arm. An idea flashed across his mind. He now decided to try some minor operation by which he could take out the pus, out of the abscesses. Some unknown power impelled him to save his arm. It did not strike him before. But now he made an effort to save the arm. As soon as the abscesses were cleared of the pus, the swelling subsided and the laceration began to heal. The joy of the surgeon, Dr. Frederick, knew no bounds. He had given up hope of saving Sajan Singh's arm, but now he felt a miracle had worked. He personally came to dress the wounds. He ordered his assistants to take extraordinary care in nursing his wounds. Happy at the success of his operation, he came to me and said, well Randir Singh, your companion is perfectly all right now. Do not worry about him. His arm has not been amputated. It is completely healed up. I said. You have been very kind and generous, and your labors have borne fruit. The superintendent said. No no, I did nothing. It was a miracle. I was ready with my instruments to amputate the arm, and just as I was about to do so, Something checked me. In a flash came the idea to me that I should try to save his arm, and what struck me suddenly had not occurred to me before. My mind suddenly changed when the young man asked me to perform the operation without the chloroform. The minor operation was performed without the chloroform, and he did not stir in pain, even once. Even if I had amputated his arm, he would not have felt the pain. It appears he was under the trance of some spiritual inspiration. After giving expression to his feelings in English he went away. I sat in thanksgiving prayer. By Sajan Singh Narangwal writes. Satis are not those that burn themselves on the husband's funeral pyre, Satis are they, O oh Nanak, who die of the pangs of separation. They are also known as Sati, who abide in modesty and contentment. They serve their Lord, and rise in the early hours to contemplate him. Guru Granth Sahib, page 787, Thank you, O merciful Guru Gobind and Nanak, for overlooking my sins. Bhai Sahib made offerings for the first time, and the Sangat supported me by reciting prayers. The fear of God and the Guru welled up inside me, and dispelled all of my fears. When the Satguru bestowed his grace upon me, my mind became as still as a mountain. Unyielding in opinion, the doctors were convinced that my life could only be saved, if my arm was amputated. Having forgotten God, the voice of their egos were speaking. They laid me down on a bed and fetched their medical weapons. I saw that no one was listening, so I stopped listening too. I got ready and surrendered myself to the Guru. I had nothing to worry about, since I no longer existed, it was all up to the brave guru now. I kept looking down at my arm from time to time. They did not amputate my arm, but cut it open to perform a minor operation. Thanks to the guru Sangat, they changed their decision. My arm was feeling better now. The great guru Gobind Singh, has been merciful to me. Unquote. Dr. Frederick performed his duties very conscientiously, and inspired confidence and efficiency in his staff. I have never seen so conscientious a British officer. He himself bandaged the arm of Sajan Singh every day. He ordered one or the other assistant surgeon to be always present to watch Sajan Singh. They had to remain with him for two hours by turn. 
even at night his assistants had to be present near the patient. He worked even on Sundays, and every night he came to see Sajan Singh at least once. We expressed our grateful thanks to him for his sympathies in so many words. End of excerpt.